This is a production of Cornell University. And what my lab is interested in is the interaction between bacterial pathogens and plants. And today I'm going to talk about two different projects in the lab. One is focused on the role of plant kinases in regulating plant immune responses. And the second um, is work on bacterial canker of tomato, uh, a disease that's caused by a xylem-limiting uh, bacterium, and some of our work understanding what regulates bacterial virulence in that system. So um, plants have a variety of different associations um, with microorganisms uh, in nature and also in agriculture, and this significantly shapes plant health and productivity uh, in these landscapes. And so uh, I, I'm sure we're all aware that there are positive associations between different microorganisms and plants, like that of nitrogen-fixing bacteria um, or mycorrhizal fungi that enable nutrient acquisition. But what we're interested in, uh, in my group, are these negative associations um, or pathogens that can infect plants and decrease uh, crop yields. And so we work on some leaf, uh, leaf pathogens, uh, like Pseudomonas syringae, uh, and we are also working on vascular pathogens that can infect um, uh, tomato uh, as well as citrus. And one of the reasons why I became interested um, as a, a younger scientist in plant pathology and decided to pursue that was because plant pathogens can really significantly impact agricultural production. And in addition, uh, there's always a, a lot of very interesting plant diseases um, that uh, are, are continuously emerging as well as really important long-standing diseases. So I've just illustrated a few here. Um, so banana uh, is particularly problematic uh, for plant disease, and it's currently being affected by a number of different fungal pathogens, including Microsporella fijiensis. And this is because all banana uh, that we eat is clonally propagated and derived from a single clone called Cavendish. So that makes breeding for resistance uh, very difficult because there's no genetic diversity there to draw from. Uh, and so because of that, there's lots of fungicide sprays that are sprayed aerially over uh, banana plantations multiple times, even within a week uh, in a growing season. Uh, another really important disease is citrus greening, or Huanlong Bing. Uh, this uh, is a long-standing disease, but it's emerged recently within the United States. Um, it's severely impacted citrus production in Florida. There's been about $5 billion worth of loss in the last um, five or six years, and it's thought that almost all trees in Florida are now infected. Uh, it's transmitted by a psyllid, uh, and it's very hard to control a flying insect. Um, and we now know that the disease is present in Texas. The psyllid's established in California, um, and there are um, uh, diseased trees within the Los Angeles area, and now we know that that's spreading within the LA County area of California. Um, and uh, uh, so this is an important uh, emerging disease within the US. Um, there are also long-standing diseases that still retain importance, like late blight of potato and tomato, uh, caused by the O. mycete Phytophthora infestans. And here you can see the uh, importance of genetic resistance, where you have one row of potato uh, that possesses an immune receptor that can recognize the pathogen, and another row that uh, lacks the corresponding immune receptor is, and is decimated by the disease. So genetic resistance can be quite robust, the issue is, is that some immune receptors can be rapidly overcome uh, by the pathogen population. And then there's also been quite a bit of basic research on plant microbe interactions that have really significantly enhanced our understanding um, of genome engineering and editing in plants, also hormone perception and um, receptor perception as well. So we work on the plant innate immune system, so plants don't actually have um, uh, adaptive immunity like you and I do. They don't have specialized immune cells that can circulate. But what they do have is a large number of germline encoded receptors that can specifically recognize all classes of pathogens. So there are receptors that are present on the cell surface called pattern recognition receptors that can specifically recognize conserved microbial features called PAMPs or MAMPs. Examples of this would be uh, bacterial flagellin or fungal chitin. Um, and these surface localized receptors recognize these microbial signatures as non-self, uh, commonly function in conjunction with a co-receptor, uh, and then elicit pattern-triggered immune responses uh, and resistance. So um, uh, 
pathogens need to be able to be adapted to inhibit uh, plant immune responses if they want to be able to cause disease. And one way that pathogens can do this is by delivery of pathogen proteins called effectors into plant cells. And these effectors, um, uh, or characterized effectors, can disrupt plant immune signaling. They can target the receptors themselves or downstream immune signaling components. Um, and these effectors can still be recognized um, in certain plant genotypes by the presence of plant resistance genes. Um, I'll call them NLRs, but basically a uh, resistance gene and an NLR can be interchangeable. Um, they're called NLRs because they have a nucleotide binding site and C-terminal leucine-rich repeats. And these NLRs can recognize the presence of pathogen effectors, trigger robust defense responses, and effector-triggered immunity. And uh, historically, it was thought that these are two distinct branches of plant immune signaling. But now we know that it's kind of more of a complicated web. Uh, and there is significant overlap in immune signaling networks between PTI and ETI. And then plants also have large arsenals of immune receptors. So if you look in uh, plant genomes and you're just looking at these um, R proteins or NLRs that can recognize uh, intracellular effectors, they range on the low end of about 54 in papaya um, to the high end of around 1,000 in domesticated apple. Um, and the repertoire differs significantly even among different genotypes uh, of a particular plant. Uh, there's also large numbers of receptor-like kinases or receptor-like proteins. These do control a range of processes, but at least a subset are going to be involved in pathogen perception. And in the model plant, Arabidopsis, there are 600 of these. Um, and the number is just increasing for NLRs as well with the advent of RENSEQ uh, to identify more NLR uh, receptors in plants. So in my lab, we work on three different pathogens, um, and I'll talk about two of them today. Uh, one disease that we work on is called bacterial spec. Um, it's caused by Pseudomonas syringae, path of our tomato, and it can infect uh, both tomato and Arabidopsis and cause these necrotic specks during later stages of disease, and that's where the disease got its name. We're primarily, um, I'll focus today on our work with Pseudomonas syringae and Arabidopsis. Uh, the other uh, pathogen that we work on is Clavibacter michiganensis, and this causes bacterial canker of tomato. You can see some of the symptoms here. Um, it's called canker because during later stages of disease, uh, the bacteria will induce the stem to split open, and this is caused a, called a canker where then bacteria can ooze out and serve as a secondary source of inoculum. Uh, and if there's a lot of bacteria around during um, flowering, you can get fruit symptoms as well. And so here we're interested in, we've performed some genome sequencing of a variety of different Clavibacter michiganensis isolates and used that for um, diag diagnostic testing, as well as to gain insight into conserved virulence mechanisms present in Clavibacter. And then I won't talk about this project, but I'd be happy to talk with anyone afterwards. Uh, we're also working on citrus greening, or Huanlong Bing. Um, here we're primarily interested in investigating the role of secreted bacterial proteins, called effectors, and what their plant targets uh, are during infection. So first I'll talk about Pseudomonas syringae and uh, our work with Arabidopsis. And uh, if you look at Pseudomonas syringae, um, it can be divided into different pathovars, and each pathovar can cause a distinct disease. Uh, and Pseudomonas in general are pretty good epiphytes. So if you go out and surf it, uh, sample the surface of a plant leaf, you'll see that uh, Pseudomonas are a core component of the phylosphere microbiome. But pathogenic Pseudomonas need to gain entry into the plant interior in order to cause disease. And they can do this by swimming through open stomata or wounds, where then they multiply in the apoplast or the space between mesophyll cells. And if it's a susceptible genotype that lacks corresponding immune receptors, you can get quite high bacterial titers and then visible uh, disease symptoms. So first I want to talk about our, our work focusing on how uh, these intracellular uh, NLR immune receptors are activated. So these NLR receptors have a conserved domain architecture. They would have either a coiled coil or tier domain at their end terminus, uh, a nucleotide binding site that could bind and hydrolyze um, ATP, and C-terminal leucine-rich repeats. And it's hypothesized at a resting state the receptor is tightly bound, and it's bound to ADP. And so uh, if a receptor directly recognizes an effector, and there are cases of this, 
what happens is um, you get exchange of ADP for ATP. Um, this is a switch for the active bound uh, form of the receptor. So now it's on an on state and can signal downstream. It can also get ATP hydrolysis to potentially recycle it back uh, to an inactive state. In indirect recognition, the model is similar, except the effector is not directly recognized. Rather, the uh, NLR guards a host protein that's targeted by the effector or a mimic of a host protein that's targeted by the effector. Um, and when the effector targets and modifies this guarded protein, this acts as a switch for receptor activation. And other outputs of effector-triggered immune responses in plants um, are kind of shown here. Uh, and outputs of ETI are really, if you're looking at uh, resistance or susceptibility, it's more of a quantitative phenotype than a qualitative phenotype. So you can see here, these are tobacco plants that have the N gene that recognizes um, the uh, portion of the tobacco mosaic virus. And you can see these resistant uh, tobacco plants, there's basically no um, viral proliferation, but compared to susceptible plants where you're looking at GFP, this is the presence of the virus there. Uh, similarly, in bacterial infection, this uh, Arabidopsis line has the RPM1 resistant uh, NLR. Uh, it, you basically see no symptoms after uh, inoculation, whereas susceptible genotypes um, look uh, very diseased. And at the, at the cellular level, a common hallmark of effector-triggered immune responses is programmed cell death at the site of infection. So this plant, if you look under the microscope, will have patches of programmed cell death. Um, and what we can do in the laboratory is go in with a higher dose of pathogen, and then you can see macroscopic cell death symptoms as well. So work in my lab has focused on uh, one key plant protein called RIN4. RIN4 is conserved across land plants, and it's been shown to be important for mediating immune responses in lettuce, tomato, soybean, uh, and also Arabidopsis. And so uh, what we know about RIN4 and Arabidopsis from work in my lab and Brian Staskowitz's lab, also Jeff Dangle's lab and Dave Mackey's lab, is that uh, it can associate with several immune receptors, and it's also targeted by a number of different bacterial effectors. So uh, at a resting state, RIN4 can associate um, with the NLR RPM1 and RPS2, holds it in an inactive state um, to suppress effector-triggered immune responses. Um, but upon um, delivery of the bacterial effector AVRB, RIN4 gets phosphorylated, and RIN4 phosphorylation was hypothesized to be a trigger to activate the RPM1 receptor, leading to effector-triggered immunity. So this is an example of indirect recognition. Um, now, we tried, and several other laboratories tried quite hard to see if AVRB was a kinase. That would be the most simple explanation. Uh, but we were never able to detect kinase activity for AVRB, so we thought there had to be another host kinase that might uh, be playing a role. And what we did is we used mass spectrometry uh, and uh, immunoprecipitation to pull down the RIN4 and RPM1 complex upon um, activation uh, and upon delivery of AVRB. And what we found uh, is a kinase called RIPK, and RIPK is a receptor-like cytoplasmic kinase. Um, and we could show in vitro that RIPK can phosphorylate RIN4 at three sites. Uh, and we mapped those sites by mass spectrometry, threonine 21, serine 160, and threonine 166. And threonine 21 and uh, threonine 166 uh, were conserved across RIN4 homologs and land plants. And we had some evidence to indicate that 3D166 would be a critical region based on where it was within the RIN4 protein. So we generated a phospho-specific antibody that would recognize phosphorylation of 3D166. And we can show that during natural infection with Pseudomonas expressing AVRB, you get RIN4 phosphorylation at 3D166. Total levels of RIN4 at this time point don't change, and the bacterial effector is also expressed and delivered. Uh, then we used a genetic approach to um, uh, determine the importance of RIN4 phosphorylation for activation of RPM1. So we changed these phospho phosphorylated residues and mimicked phosphorylation by changing them to um, aspartic acid. And then uh, if we looked at the resulting uh, lines when we tried to complement RIN4, if we mimic RIN4 phosphorylation, you see the plants are sw small, dwarf, they're lesion mimic, so this is a hallmark for constitutive activation of immune responses. 
Um, whereas if uh, we cross these lines into a genotype that did no longer possess the RPM1 immune receptor, these plants looked phenotypically normal. And then um, using transient expression in Nicotiana, we also um, determined what the critical residue was uh, that's required for uh, recognition by RPM1. And so here, if we co-express RPM1 with various versions of RIN4, we can see that co-expressing with a phospho mimic of threonine 166 induces uh, this macroscopic hypersensitive response, which is a hallmark of effector-triggered responses. And then uh, if you look at RIN4, it doesn't look like it's an enzyme of any kind, uh, although it's conserved, um, and it has a high predicted level of intrinsic disorder. So um, we tested the hypothesis that potentially phosphorylation might change uh, 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 secondary structure or some aspect of flexibility. We didn't see any change in gross secondary structure. And what we did is we, what we, we phosphorylated RIN4 in the presence of RIPK using recombinant proteins, um, then got rid of uh, RIPK uh, using centrifugation, and then subjected either phosphorylated here or unphosphorylated RIN4 to CD spectroscopy. And you can see here for wild type RIN4, you get a peak uh, at low wavelength, and that's cons consistent with this being uh, uh, intrinsically disordered or random coil protein. Uh, and it, you see a stronger negative elliptice uh, in the presence of phosphorylated RIN4, indicating that it's a more flexible protein. You see similar things if we're looking at wild type RIN4 or a phosphomimetic uh, mutant here by CD spectroscopy. Um, and then we also searched for potentially other players that could play a role in early recognition of RPM1. And this is a collaboration between my group uh, and Jim and Sao's group at Chinese Academy of Sciences. And what they identified was a point mutation in a cyclophilin uh, that had enhanced ac enzymatic activity, uh, but compromised RPM1-mediated recognition. So cyclophilins are cis-trans isomerases, uh, and they catalyze this uh, for peptidyl prolyl bonds. And this is a rate-limiting step during fo protein folding. And if we looked at this particular point mutation uh, within ROC1, and we performed disease assays using virulent bacteria, here on the y-axis you can see uh, bacterial growth um, on a log scale. And then this is days post inoculation. You can see there's not a difference between wild type Columbia and the ROC1 point mutation or any null mutations within uh, uh, NLR immune receptors. But if we look, we could see a specific effect uh, after uh, activation of RPM1 in resistant plants. Uh, and so what you can see here is that. Columbia can, can recognize AVRB through the presence of RPM1, so it has much lower bacterial growth than here. Um, and then the ROC1 point mutation was compromised in RPM1 recognition. This here is the RPM1 uh, null mutant. And then we did some mapping of the importance of uh, proline residues across RIN4 for activating RPM1 um, and mutated every single proline residue. And first, the uh, graduate student that was doing it, I said, don't, don't do that because that's going to grossly mess up the, the structure and you're going to get a lot of uh, results that aren't going to be easy to interpret. But I was wrong because there was only one mutant uh, that uh, gave a phenotype and that was proline at position 149. So sometimes it's good the students don't listen to you uh, and just go and do the experiment. <laughs> so here what we've done is we've taken a peptide of RIN4 surrounding proline 149, labeled it, and then subjected that to NMR spectroscopy. And you can see that this is the general structure. And then if we add in unlabeled ROC1, you're still only looking at RIN4, what we can see is specific isomerization um, here and here uh, surrounding proline 149. So that indicates that in vitro, uh, ROC1 can isomerize RIN4 at position uh, 149. And then we tested to see what's the effect of this uh, on the ability to induce RIN4 phosphorylation. So first, if we look in plants uh, at this ROC1 point mutation that has higher isomerization capability, uh, that uh, after delivery of AVRB, we see much lower ability to induce RIN4 phosphorylation. And if we delete uh, proline 149 from RIN4, we can see that at a basal level, you, much, you have much higher basal phosphorylation uh, of RIN4. So this is our current model of RPM1 activation. 
We know that RPM1 is at the membrane. Um, it can associate at a resting state with RIPK, RIN4, and ROC1. And RIN4 is isomerized by ROC1, we predict, at a resting state. Upon delivery of AVRB, um, AVRB can dimerize with um, RIPK. ROC1 disassociates. RIN4 is now in a, a cis conformation at its proline 149 residue. This uh, enables stronger phosphorylation uh, via RIPK, and then subsequently we know that RIPK and AVRB disassociate from the complex, but RIN4 and RPM1 stay at the membrane, and you get activation of RPM1 uh, and induction of defense responses. So um, this association with ROC1 enforces the inactive state prior to recognition because you want really close control over uh, activation of plant immune responses because there's an energetic cost to inducing immunity and enforces actually the active state after recognition so you get robust immune responses there. And we've also done some work to try to figure out why effectors would actually target RIN4 in the absence um, uh, uh, of RPM1. So I mentioned that there's a large number of NLR immune receptors that are present in plant genomes. But um, the NLR complement can vary significantly depending on the plant genotype. So our hypothesis was that in the absence of RPM1, RIN4 phosphorylation would enhance bacterial virulence. And this would be maybe one reason why multiple effectors would target RIN4, because it's not going to be beneficial to them if it's inducing immunity. Uh, and so we were able to show that uh, RIN4-mediated phosphorylation inside mesophyll cells suppresses pattern-triggered immune responses. So you get lower extracellular ROS burst, um, altered MAP kinase kinetics, and increased growth of non-adapted pathogens. Uh, we are also able to show a number of years ago uh, in this PLOS biology paper that RIN4 can associate with a plasma membrane pump called AHA. Um, and uh, what we found was is that phosphorylated RIN4 could more strongly associate with AHA and induces enhanced um, uh, activity. And if you look at plants uh, that are phosphomimics for RIN4, what we see is that they have wider basal stomatal apertures. And we also know that AVRB, when you inoculate Pseudomonas thuringii expressing AVRB, it can also manipulate stomatal apertures uh, upon surface inoculation. So now I want to switch gears and talk about another kinase that we've been working on, uh, and this is PBL13. And uh, PBL13 and RIPK are closely related. They're both members of these receptor-like cytoplasmic kinases. So uh, here is just a, um, a diagram of the receptor-like kinases, and you can see these receptor-like cytoplasmic kinases. Uh, their kinase domain is similar to the RLKs, but they lack uh, an extracellular domain. And there's a, a number of different um, uh, subfamilies within the RLCKs, and one particular subfamily called subfamily 7 uh, has been demonstrated to be important in immunity uh, in Arabidopsis. And so here is just the phylogeny of um, subfamily 7, and why we became interested initially in PBL13 is because it's closely related uh, to RIPK. Um, and other members that are, uh, have been intensely studied in this area are also um, uh, PBS5 and BIC1, and they all belong to the subfamily 7. But PBL13 actually looks uh, different than these other RLCKs, and that's because um, it has a unique amino acid repeat uh, of 15 amino acids that are repeated five times at its C terminus. Uh, the rest of the RLCK looks very similar to other RLCKs. It has all of the um, catalytic subdomains that would, you'd predict it would be an active kinase. Uh, it has a palmitylation motif at its end terminus, and we've shown that it can go to the membrane as well. So a graduate student in the lab, Dan Lin, was um, focused on the role of PBL13, and so he obtained two different tDNA insertion lines in PBL13. One's called PBL13-1, and the other one, which has a tDNA insertion uh, right before this amino acid repeat, and it's a truncated allele. Uh, and the other is PBL13-2 that has a tDNA insertion closer to the beginning of the um, gene and is a true knockout. And what we found is that both tDNA insertions had identical disease phenotypes, uh, which indicates that this C-terminus uh, is important for PBL13 function. 
And so here is just phenotype after dip inoculation with virulent pseudomonas. You can see Columbia is diseased. You see yellowing here, uh, whereas the tDNA insertion uh, looks much better. And if we look um, either by dip or after pressure infiltration, syringe infiltration, we can see that um, these tDNA insertion lines uh, exhibit enhanced disease resistance. So here's bacterial growth on the y-axis, and you can see uh, both of these have at least a log uh, decrease in bacterial growth. So it's a pretty strong phenotype. And we can complement um, this enhanced resistance phenotype uh, by adding in wild-type PBL13. So it looks like PBL13 is an active kinase. Um, and indeed, when we performed in vitro kinase activity assays uh, with radio-labeled P32, we can see that it is an active kinase. Uh, we already knew RIPK is a kinase, so we use this as a positive control. PBL13 can uh, autophosphorylate and transphosphorylate, a common kinase substrate. And then uh, if we have this lysine mutant, it's no longer an active kinase. And what we also noticed is this is recombinant protein from E. coli here. Wild type PBL13 uh, migrated abnormally large based on SDS page gels, whereas the kinase dead variant uh, ran at its predicted molecular weight. And we know that uh, by treatment with SIP that this is due to um, heavy autophosphorylation. And then we tested the importance of kinase activity uh, for its resistance phenotype. And we can see that the PBL13's kinase activity is actually functionally required. Because you can't complement the enhanced disease resistance phenotype by adding in a kinase dead variant of PBL13. So we were interested in what uh, residues within PBL13 are actually phosphorylated. So we subjected the protein to mass spectrometry and mapped phosphorylated sites. And what we could see is there are a few residues within the kinase domain that are phosphorylated, and uh, they're the serine, serine, and threonine. But if you look at the percentage of the phosphopeptide distribution, we can see that the vast, these, this correlates to one spectra and around three spectra, respectively. Uh, but the vast majority of phosphorylated residues are present within this repeat region. Um, and since it's a repeat region, it was a little bit difficult to actually nail down unambiguously what particular residues were phosphorylated. So we used a few different enzymes and we could get um, some uh, unambiguous spectra uh, indicating that likely this repeat of threonine serine is phosphorylated on most of the repeats. So we're interested now in why actually PBL13 is more resistant. Um, we hypothesize it's a negative regulator. If we look at um, uh, uh, the plants, they don't actually look um, uh, phenotypically different uh, than wild type Arabidopsis. They don't have much higher levels of salicylic acid. Um, but we do think that it, and so there we think it's actually, uh, but we do think it's a negative regulator because it has such a strong enhanced disease resistance phenotype. And we know that immune responses have to be uh, tightly regulated. There is a trade-off between plant growth uh, and plant defense. And so the timing and also the amplitude uh, of immune responses are tightly controlled within the plant. So these are just some common outputs of plant immunity. Uh, and we looked at a few of them for PBL13. So one is you get this uh, uh, reactive oxygen uh, ROS burst, this extracellular ROS burst upon pathogen perception. Um, this is by an NADPH oxidase. This uh, extracellular ROS then serves as an antimicrobial. It can also uh, lead to cell wall reinforcement. Um, and then downstream of immune perception, very early events also are this calcium influx, which is an important secondary messenger. You also get activation of specific MAP kinase cascades that lead to um, transcriptional reprogramming in the nucleus. So we looked at a few of these, ROS uh, and MAP kinase activation. And what we were able to show is that the PBL13 knockout has enhanced MAP-induced ROS burst. Uh, so here, what we do to measure the ROS burst is we use a luminol-based assay. And so here you can see the sum of the relative light units on the y-axis and then the different genotypes on the x-axis. So uh, when we add in uh, a bacterial MAMP called um, ELF18, uh, what we see is that you can get uh, rapid ROS production in Columbia. The PBL13 knockout has higher ROS burst, and this can be complemented by one of the PBL13 complementation lines. Um, also, uh, if we apply bacterial, an immunogenic epitope of bacterial flagellin, we can see that uh, Columbia can respond to this. 
Um, the PBL13 knockout has an in enhanced response, and this can be complemented uh, in the complementation lines. The next thing we looked at uh, was MAP kinase activation. And here what we can see is that um, this occurs between typically 10 and 15 minutes uh, after uh, applying uh, a recognized microbial pattern. Here we're looking at bacterial uh, FLY22 um, application. So you can see a strong expression of phosphorylated uh, MAP kinases around 15 minutes um, after treatment. But we see faster um, expression at five minutes in the PBL13 knockout. And then this is just the flagellin receptor mutant uh, as a negative control. And so both of these are very early processes. This is going to occur around 10 minutes after uh, bacterial or, or pathogen perception. The ROS burst occurs, you know, five to uh, at least by five minutes after perception. So we think that this is going to be an early response. So we are interested in this ROS uh, phenotype. And um, previous work out of uh, Jim and Zhao's lab, as well as Cyril Zipfel's lab, had shown that a related kinase called BIC1 is involved uh, in phosphorylating the NADPH oxidase RBOHD. And RBOHD is responsible for producing this extracellular ROS. Uh, it produces a superoxide, uh, which is then rapidly dismutated into hydrogen peroxide and can serve as an antimicrobial. And what they were able to show with BIC1 is um, after flagellin perception, BIC1 is able to associate with RBOHD, phosphorylate it, and this act to prime subsequent phosphorylation by calcium-dependent protein kinases, uh, leading to enhanced activity. So because PBL13 had an opposite phenotype as BIC1, we are interested in its association with RBOHD. So here we're using a split luciferase assay, where you can take um, one protein and fuse it to one half of luciferase, another protein fuse it to another half of luciferase, and then if they uh, associate, you can see um, uh, luminescence within the plant. And this is transient expression in Nicotiana. So here we can see that um, PBL13 can associate with RBOHD at a resting state, but um, opposite to BIC1, it rapidly disassociates upon flagellin perception. And uh, this is a negative control, an aquaporin that's also membrane localized uh, to show that there's no signal there. We also looked for associations by split luciferase or CoIP between primary immune receptors uh, and PBL13, and we didn't detect that. So this is our current model uh, for PBL13 function, and I should also mention that we know that PBL13 can phosphorylate our BOHD uh, C terminus as well, and we're currently mapping those sites by mass spectrometry. So we see that PBL13 has enhanced disease resistance, it has a higher ROS burst, and faster MAP kinase kinetics. Um, and we hypothesize that it acts to suppress defense responses in the absence of pathogen perception. Uh, it's unique among RLCKs because it has an extended C-terminal domain that's heavily phosphorylated, at least in vitro. We're interested in determining the importance uh, in vivo of PBL13 C-terminal phosphorylation. Um, and um, we think that it could compete with BIC1 to regulate the extracellular ROS burst. So we know there's different pools of PBL13 within the plant cell. Uh, potentially, one pool could be involved in suppressing uh, MAP kinase activation because we know ROS burst and MAP kinase perception can be genetically uncoupled. Uh, but there's a pool of PBL13 that can also associate with RBOHD, potentially phosphorylating it at novel sites in order to suppress activity in the absence of pathogen perception. Uh, but in the presence uh, of pathogen perception or elicitors, PBL13 disassociates, enabling BIC1 to come in and phosphorylate, which then primes for subsequent phosphorylation by calcium dependent protein kinases uh, and an enhanced ROS burst uh, upon pathogen perception. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk uh, about uh, the final project. Uh, and this is uh, looking at the interaction between a gram-positive bacterial pathogen, Clavobacter michigansis, uh, subspecies michigansis, uh, and tomato. So uh, this pathogen causes bacterial canker of tomato. I've just shown some disease symptoms here. It proliferates in the xylem vessels. Uh, and if you uh, look at an infected tomato stem, you can see browning of the xylem here. 
Uh, there's also leaf symptoms where you can, this is called the leaf firing stage, where you can get marginal leaflet necrosis, uh, which is the hallmark of the disease as well. And then if there's a lot of bacteria around flowering, uh, during flowering you can get fruit symptoms. These are called bird's eye spots because there's a black spot surrounded by a white margin or halo. And you can also get infection of the vasculature of the fruit uh, by the pathogen as well. Um, sources of inoculum are infected seeds, uh, infected tool stakes or transplants. Um, the bacteria can also survive several years on crop debris in the field. Um, and uh, when you have this canker formation, what happens is the bacteria then will ooze out, get bacterial streaming, and in the presence of water, uh, they can then move from one plant to another plant. So that can serve as a secondary source of inoculum as well. So um, uh, CMM has a high GC content. Uh, it's uh, xylem limited. It's subjected to international quarantine because it's particularly problematic uh, within um, glasshouse greenhouse production. Uh, and there is no genetic resistance in commercial cultivars. Uh, there have been a few sources of resistance that have been identified uh, in wild tomato species, but they're primarily associated with altered um, uh, vascular morphology, and so they have negative horticultural attributes that are associated with them. So uh, they haven't been successful in then transferring those into uh, cultivated germplasm. So right now, the control strategy is C disinfestation. Copper sprays don't really work very well. Um, and uh, in the literature, there's one completely finished reference genome uh, that was published a number of years ago. So what we are interested in doing is collecting a large number of CMM strains uh, to represent the worldwide diversity and then using phylogeny to sequence a number of these strains. And so here is just a map that's highlighting the geographical distribution of these different uh, CMM strains. So we collected from six continents over about six decades uh, and then used phylogeny of five core housekeeping genes to try to figure out which strains we really wanted to sequence. So we sequenced uh, a number of different uh, CMM strains, um, 34 uh, pathogenic strains, and then five saprophytes. So there are closely related um, clavibacter strains that are non-pathogenic that are saprophytic. So they kind of hang out. They'll uh, grow a little bit within the tomato, uh, but they won't cause disease. But this is problematic because then if a grower wants to test to see if they have bacterial canker, um, they're, these will light up with any kind of a, a, a currently based ELISA techniques. So um, this is problematic for, for disease control. Uh, and also, if they detect that there's actually um, clavibacter there, they have to get rid of all of their plants, when it could be just saprophytic clavibacter. Um, now, I mentioned that CMM has a high GC content. It's at least 72%. So we did Illumina sequencing, um, but that became, and, and it also has a number of repetitive elements uh, within the genome. But we couldn't get great assemblies just based on Illumina sequencing. So for a subset of these, um, we went in and did uh, PAC bio sequencing as well. Uh, and there, that worked quite well. We were able to get completely finished reference genomes uh, and completely uh, uh, complete plasmid uh, sequences just in a single shot. Um, so what I'll talk about uh, from now is mainly our work on the PAC bio sequences. Um, and we also sequenced. Um, in this number of 34, uh, some CMM strains that were collected uh, within California as well. So in 2011 uh, and also uh, 2015, what we had in California was this vine decline disease, which uh, basically what we've found right now is that it's a combination of fungal infection of the roots uh, as well as uh, clavibacter uh, infection, um, which combines to have a decrease in productivity during later stages uh, of the disease. And so most of the tomatoes that are grown in California are for processing. Um, and UC Davis is in Yolo County. That's where they grow a lot of tomatoes. Uh, so we've collected a number of isolates just right around the university uh, in collaboration with farm advisors. And also the San Joaquin Valley grows quite a bit of uh, uh, tomatoes as well. So um, what we first looked at were the plasmid complements. Um, and as I mentioned, they're saprophytic clavibacter. So this is one of the saprophytes we sequenced. You can inoculate, but you don't see disease symptoms. Uh, plants look healthy. Um, this is a, one of the pathogenic uh, strains that we sequenced. And this is the reference genome that's been uh, studied the most. So the reference genome has two plasmids, PCM1 and PCM2. 
Um, both are required for uh, disease symptoms. So you can delete these uh, from the genome or, or cure them from the bacteria. Bacteria can still replicate, but they don't cause wilting symptoms. Um, what we found was there's a variation in plasmid complement uh, among the strains that we've sequenced, which is really similar to what uh, has been found for uh, uh, some of the strains that have come out of Cornell as well, um, and, and around the, the Cornell area and in New York. Uh, so they have vary in their plasmid complement. All of the strains that we sequenced have PCM1, um, but there's variation in the presence of PCM2 and or presence of other plasmids. Um, and saprophytes have neither PCM1 or PCM2, but they have a novel uh, plasmid uh, that we call PCM sap. And if you look at this circles plot of the reference strain in one of the California strains for PCM1, it's similar for others, you can see that uh, these lines here indicate that uh, there's homology and those genes are present. Uh, there's, there's high homology between um, sap, uh, other strains uh, and the reference strain with respect to PCM1. And if you look at bacterial growth, um, PCM2 uh, is not necessary because this California strain can grow quite well, uh, just as well as the reference strain. And then, like I mentioned, the saprophyte will grow a little bit, but not to the same extent. So we looked at the, the genome to predict uh, secreted effector proteins. So this is a gram-positive bacteria. So um, it can't deliver effectors directly into host cells, but it can secrete effectors outside of its own cell. Uh, and so what we found when we were mining for the secretome is that there's a set of about 40 effectors uh, that are conserved across pathogens and saprophytes. There is also around 10 that are only found in all the pathogens that we looked at, and then there's a variable number of effectors as well. If we look at these conserved effectors, most of them look like uh, that are at least that, that have been uh, have an assigned potential function would be degradative enzymes or secreted proteases. Then we also looked at the presence of genomic islands, and so bacteria can acquire um, uh, uh, DNA horizontally either through conjugation for plasmids, viral infection, or um, uh, through the environment, and this can be detected uh, based on their uh, deviation in GC content. So if we look at the genomic islands present um, between saprophytes, pathogens in California, and pathogens in the reference strain, we can see that most, there's only one large genomic island that's present um, both uh, in the reference strain as well as all the other strains that we um, sequenced, and the other genomic islands are variable. And the genomic island that's uh, conserved is called the CHP Tom A pathogenicity cluster. So I've just highlighted it here. And you can see it's quite conserved um, uh, across the reference strain. This is one of the California strains, and this is the saprophyte where it's lacking. So there's been some work that's been done on CHP Tom A uh, on, in Clavobacter. We know if you delete the entire genomic island, it abolishes pathogenicity. If you delete uh, just CHPC, which is shown here in yellow, um, this is a serine protease that's secreted um, that decreases virulence. Um, and what we are interested in is what about some degradative enzymes? Because you do get this canker formation, there's maceration of the host tissue, you get the stem splitting open during later stages of disease, and we know that the genome encodes several putative degradative enzymes. Um, and so we focused on the importance of two um, potential degradative enzymes, PEL-A1 and PEL-A2 that are conserved, that are pectate lyases. So if we look at PEL-A1 and PEL-A2, they're predicted to be secreted. They have a, a central, uh, and this is cleaved then afterwards, they have a central pectate lyase domain. Um, if we look at crystallized pectate lyases, we can generate high confidence uh, models. It really looks like a pectate lyase. The uh, catalytic sites are conserved between PEL-A1, PEL-A2, and characterized pectate lyases. Um, and then if we perform knockouts uh, of either PEL-A1 or PEL-A2, what we can see is that the PEL-A1 deletion um, in Clavobacter has reduced symptom morphology. We don't see this fi leaf firing stage, whereas the PEL-A2 deletion doesn't really affect uh, bacterial virulence. And we can see a decrease in bacterial growth, uh, but it's not very robust here. So this may be affecting symptom morphology and not necessarily bacterial colonization. But we need to go back in and look over time and potentially look at movement within the plant as well. 
Uh, and then if we look at expression of Pele 1 and Pele 2, uh, if we look in rich media, both are expressed at a fairly low level. But if we look uh, and grow the bacteria in xylem mimicking media, minimal media, we can see that Pele 1 uh, is much stronger expressed than Pele 2. Uh, and Pele 1, the deletion, is the one that gives us uh, a phenotype after we inoculate on tomato. So we've also used um, these genome sequences to try to develop uh, diagnostic primers for growers and industry to use. Um, so what we did is we looked at um, our genome sequences of pathogenic Clavobacter, saprophytic Clavobacter. We also sequenced some genomes of a related pathogen, um, subspecies Cepodonicus, that causes potato ring rot. Um, and we designed about 10 different PCR-based primers uh, that should specifically detect uh, pathogenic clavobacter, but not saprophytes. And then we found two that very robustly amplify and looked quite specific. Uh, one is based on a sugar ABC transporter. The other is based on a transcriptional regulator. And so uh, we've provided these to growers uh, to now use uh, for diagnostics where they wouldn't detect uh, these saprophytes or other pathogens. So uh, just to summarize, we've completely finished genomes for about seven um, uh, CMM strains using PacBio. Uh, use that to develop specific PCR primers. We know these strains are not clonal. There's variation in plasmid composition, genomic islands, also uh, in secretome. Uh, we can see there's about 10 core secreted uh, proteins uh, from uh, Clavobacter. And we started to investigate a subset of these secreted proteins for their role in bacterial virulence. Um, the conserved uh, PEL-A1 pectate lyase is important for bacterial symptom morphology, but deletion of a clustered and closely related um, uh, pectate lyase, PEL-A2, has no effect, and that may be because it's not robustly expressed during infection. So I'd like to thank the people in the lab that have done the work. Um, work on RIN4 was uh, initially started by Jun Li, a previous postdoc in the lab who's now faculty member at Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, and also, uh, uh, Deng Hook Lee, a graduate student, has worked on that project as well. Work on PBL13 was led by a former graduate student, Dan Lin, um, as well as Deng Hook Lee. And then um, work on uh, Clavobacter has been performed uh, by a postdoc in the lab, Shri Thapa, and then Coast, uh, Thomas, and Jessica have also contributed to the RIN4 project. Um, also, uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators and then uh, funding uh, for support. So, thank you. You know, so the question was because PBL13 and RIPK are closely related, but it seems like they have different functions. Uh, so, the question was are they functionally redundant? Um, initially, the reason why we were interested in PBL13 is we thought that it could be um, uh, functionally redundant with RIPK and we might be able to get more severe phenotypes when we made uh, uh, higher order mutants. And we, we tried that, so we have double mutants of PBL13 and RIPK, uh, but we don't see that there uh, is more of a significant phenotype, let's say, with respect to activation. Uh, of RPM1 or loss of RPM1 activation than just the RIPK knockout. So I think they're actually doing uh, different things. Uh, if you just look at the central region, it looks very, very similar to uh, RIPK. So what we're trying to do now is just take um, PBL13 central region and, if we, and see if we can complement the RIPK knockout just with that as compared with Poland. Um, but I think there's something that's going on with the C-terminus that might determine specificity. Um, we're also doing some kinase assays with truncated PDL13 versus full length to see if that changes um, ability to uh, phosphorylate particular residues uh, within target proteins. And do you know anything about their expression, the way they're expressed? So, the tissues the yeah, so RIPK is uh, expressed in strongly in the root and also within the, uh, the leaves. Uh, but more strongly in the root, um, and it has a much higher expression than PBL13. So PBL13 is very lowly expressed um, in the root as well as in uh, uh, the leaf and in senescent tissues. Uh, but its, its expression level is quite low. Yeah. Oh, okay, so the question was, for citrus greening, is it edible after infection? Well, um, in the juicing industry for Florida, uh, it, 
they can use cer cer certain things to um, uh, the, the juice, like add sugars, etc., and then that will uh, still enable them to sell uh, the product. You know, during later stages of disease, it's going to kill the citrus plant. So then, obviously, yield will be reduced. But um, part of the phenotypes for citrus greening and why they, they called it citrus greening is that you get this um, inversion of, uh, ripe, of uh, the ripening of the fruit. So usually, uh, it'll ripen at the bottom first and then go up. And then here, when you have citrus greening, you have green at the bottom and then ripening at the top. You get the pathogen proliferates in the phloem. And so you get more bitter fruit. Uh, because uh, there's phloem blockage uh, by uh, talos, and so there's decreased uh, sugar accumulation within the fruit. So it's possible to do some things uh, for uh, its juicing industry, for a fresh market, uh, there's not much you can do. So the question is, if the um, PBL13's general function is to dampen ROS, does the mutant have phenotypes in addition to defense responses? Um, so that's a good question. We're looking at that right now. So some of these RBOH mutants have altered root morphology, et cetera. We know that PDL13 is uh, expressed in roots. And so I don't have the answer uh, now, but we're looking into it to see if they can phenocopy uh, some of those uh, mutant phenotypes. Yeah, and if they do, then that would, I think that would indicate that there may be um, additional functions for PDL13 outside of just This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.